Goodness gracious, it's good to see you guys today. We had a big event here last night. About 350 ladies came and joined. I understand, Debbie, it was phenomenal. Excited about that opportunity to be able to see our ladies celebrate the Lord and and uh, to be able to see them get back up tomorrow, this morning and come back to church. Amen? Uh, we are do, having a little bit of a rainstorm today ahead of Milton. Who would have ever thunk it? I mean, my goodness. We have, uh, I guess, have an opportunity this coming week to be able to uh, uh, have Milton come up through I-4. He wants to go to Disney and Universal, I guess, and so uh, he'll stop by here on the way there, I suppose, but uh, please do keep in touch with uh, emails. We will be making sure we communicate as best we can this week to be able to let p people know what's going on, and so I want to make sure that uh, you are aware of that. I want to do something different today uh, as than we normally do. I'm going to ask you if you would to stand where you are. And I'm going to ask you, if you would, to go and find a couple of three people today and shake their hand. But I want you to ask them this question. How can I pray for you today? Just hold on to those thoughts. But if you would, go visit a couple of people this morning. We'll come back together in just a moment or two, would you? Mike, Mike, the great challenge we have is to how to get people back together after this, you know, but uh, anyway. How can I pray for you? Oh, my goodness. Okay, guys. I am going to give you a little bit of time after a while to go pray for people. But uh, anyway, I'm not sure. Steve, let's sing us a song. How about that? Let's sing us a song. Oh, my goodness. That's the beautiful thing about a church and the church family that we gather together and we can love on each other and be able to celebrate the accomplishments of each other. And so uh, as you're heading back to your seats this morning, I love that, David. Hug on that young lady. We're going to find our Bibles this morning, Ephesians chapter 1 is where we will spend our time for the balance of today. And as you've already seen that there's going to be some sermon illustration today, I'm not very creative and so this thing is taking me out of my comfort zone, but I feel as though that I need to be able to try and do my best to illustrate what we're going to be talking about today. Last week, we had the opportunity to learn and to be reminded of this great gift that we have in Jesus Christ. 
You know, our parents created us with pure life. You know, they, we were, as children, were individuals who found themselves almost perfect, you know, and then, then we weren't. And then, uh, but every one of us as children and as young adults and as adults have come to the place in our life while we were born as sinners, we have chosen to sin. And as we have chosen to sin in our life, ultimately that which was once without spot and blemish has become tainted because of the effects of sin in our life. And we found ourselves as individuals sinners, not only by birth, but also by choice. And so this represents you and I. And in our life, so many times we want to do good things in our life. And sometimes we want to add good stuff to our life to try to make it all better. But the reality is we can do all kinds of good things and it's really not going to take away the stain and the mark of sin in our life. Jesus Christ, however, was came into the world. He lived a perfect life. He was pure life. And the scripture says to him, he is the way, the truth, and the he is pure life. He was tempted in all ways just like we were and yet without sin. And then the reality is he came in this world to be able to be a ransom for many. We talked about that last, last week in him, verse 7, Ephesians 1. We have the redemption. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. And so when you and I come to the place in our life that we realize and understand that we are lost and separated without him, that our lives are marred by sin, never can be fixed by us. And when we choose to open our hearts and let Christ come in, the scripture says when Christ comes into our life, he takes that which was stained with sin and cleans it up and purifies it because only Christ can do that. We are even in our song we sang, what only God can do. We may try, we may do our best efforts, but only God can do certain things. The reality is, as we think about this life that we're given, and I'm going to remove a few things off the table today, not that I'm trying to de-emphasize any of them, but simply trying to make sure that we have an opportunity today to be able to continue the journey as we have started. But Ephesians chapter 1, verses... 11, 12, 13, and 14 will be our text today. And in reality, this passage is talking to us about something that's very specific that the Spirit does for us. You see, verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 has to do with the Father's choice. Our Heavenly Father, the God of glory, the one who spoke and the worlds came into existence, He chose you and I in Him even before the foundations of the world. He, he knew exactly how rotten that we would be, and even in our rottenness, he chose to love us and to offer us a, a new life in Christ. Jesus Christ determined before the foundations of the world that he would come into the world and suffer and die on Calvary's cross in order that he might be able to pay for the debt of sin that every one of us have, have, have accumulated in our life. And we've got a bunch of it. All of us do. And yet Jesus Christ came, determined before the world's ever came into existence, that he would ultimately come and suffer and die and make a payment for our sin debt. And today, we stand as individuals clean because of God's work through the person of Jesus Christ in us. But there's one more person of the tr Trinity that we've not yet talked about, and that's the Spirit of God. As a matter of fact, when we come to this passage today, we're going to be talking about the Spirit's work in our life, His provision for us. Again, doing what only God can do. Only God could have chosen us in Himself before the foundation of the world. Only God through Jesus Christ could have paid the penalty of sin debt. And only the work of the Holy Spirit can do what He's, we're going to be talking about Him doing today. And that's securing us, making us safe, guaranteeing us a place of security and safety. I'm reminded back a few years ago, I read an article, and I, I have come across that article again this week in preparing for today, about, you know, there's some things in life that we, we were sure that were going to be absolutely secure. Remember the, remember the Titanic? I believe it was called the unsinkable what? Molly Brown, wasn't that it? Something, wasn't that term, terminology, something like that? Anyway guaranteed you couldn't sink this thing if you tried I mean but the reality was it didn't take nothing but an iceberg to be able to take the the unsinkable ship and put it on the bottom of the ocean 
there was another instance that took place in 1941 that everyone in America thought could never happen. As a matter of fact, in 1938, Major George F. Elliott, the, the, the correspondent of military affairs, said in 1938, he said this, a Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor is a strategic impossibility. Three years later, remember this, remember the date, on December 4th, 1941, the Secretary of, of the Navy, Frank Knox at the time, said it this way, no matter what happens, the U.S. Navy will never be caught napping. Three days later, when most of Pearl Harbor was asleep, on December 7th, 1941, it was duty officer uh, Lieutenant Kermit Tyler, upon being told that there was radar had picked up some unidentified formation of planes that were closing fast on Hawaii, said without apology, don't worry about it, it is nothing that we have to worry about. And while these three professionals in their field proclaimed security of the island of, of, of Hawaii, the reality was they didn't have a whole lot to depend upon. We, didn't, we couldn't have trusted them because the reality in just a few hours, Pearl Harbor was going to be under attack and the rest is history, right? We do know this, is that the security of any individual or, or of anything is only as good as the one who is promising security. And you and I, through the person of the Holy Spirit, have the opportunity to be promised security, not rooted in our good deeds, not rooted in our best efforts, not rooted in the church that we attend or whatever else we might accomplish in life, but rooted in this one fact that he alone is able to keep us, Jude verse 24 said, to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the throne in that last day. We have an opportunity to be able to know that with absolute certainty that the God of creation not only chose us, not only offered to us redemption that would ultimately wash our sins away, but ultimately offered us a place of security that nobody can take away. I thought about this, what can I do? How can I talk about sealing something today? And well, I chose a Ziploc baggie. They're good for a lot of things. You, you can put them in your freezer. And as long as you don't leave that stuff in your freezer for, I don't know, two or three years, it probably is pretty good shape. But the reality is sometimes we forget what's in the bottom of our freezer and you have to go through it once in a while. And there's some things you find there you think, oh my goodness, well, I'll never eat that. But I'm so grateful to know that Ziploc baggies does a lot of wonderful things for us, including spill it when you're trying to get all the air out. But the Ziploc bag is a wonderful thing. It actually is, it, it brings about a sense of security and stability. It ultimately brings about a sense of opportunity for us to be able to be able to put things away and to know that things are not going to leak. And apart from what I spilt out, it's not going to leak. It's, it's going to give an opportunity to be able to just be absolutely secure. What we need to know that the scripture teaches us in Ephesians chapter 1, if you'll pick up with me starting in verse 11, in him... Let me back up if I can to verse 7, just because we set in context all of our conversations. Verse 7 says this, In him we have redemption through his blood, that's Jesus, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. Verse 11 says, in him we have obtained an inheritance. In, having been predestined, God determined it. The Father determined it. According to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ, relationally in relationship with Christ. Might be, the, be the, to the praise of his glory. Verse 13. In him you were also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed upon him, were sealed with the promise of who? The Holy Spirit. So what happens in your life and my life, and I'm trying to wipe up my little water mess as I'm going, is that when you and I accepted Christ as our personal Savior, not only did the, 
the, the, the son's work to pay for our sin, wash our sins away, but the spirit work to take our, our, our lives that now have been washed and cleaned and to actually put it in a position in our life where we find ourselves secure in Christ or in the Holy Spirit. He has sealed us under the day of redemption. Now, we may understand this in life, and I'm going to take a little bit of opportunity today that I didn't do a first service, but I'm going, to tr- I'm going to make a little bit more of a mess up here today, if I can. When you and I accept Christ as our personal Savior, I'm going to set this aside for just a moment. You and I need to know that when we accept Christ as our personal Savior, that everything that Christ has done in us has now been sealed and secured until the day of redemption. Nobody can undo that. Nobody can, uh, can, can undo what God has done in us. We are sealed in Him. We as individuals at times still sin. And we've got all kinds of things happening in life. Do y'all, has anybody sinned this year? Okay, all right. We do from time to time. We get mad at somebody. We drive on I-4 and, you know, whatever it may be, and we get all kinds of things. But the reality is, whatever sin may do on the outside of the container, it can never destroy what God has done on the inside of the container. And so what God has secured is secured in Christ. And we are still and will be presented before him as perfect individuals, not because we are perfect, not because you wanted to be perfect, but because Christ has made you perfect because of what he has done in forgiving your sins. And now the Spirit has sealed you so that when you will be presented before him as perfect, not because you are or will ever become perfect, but because of what Christ has done to preserve you and to, to, the, day of, to the day of redemption. And we've got this same, we've got all kinds of baggies this morning. We've got, we got average size baggies. We've got, we got some big baggies. We've got some pint size baggies or whatever these are, you know. You know, some of us, are, some, some of us come to Christ when we're young and, and small. Some of us come to Christ when we're older and when we're a lot wiser or not. <laughs> And some of us come to Christ at the different times in our life, but no matter when we come to Christ, we find ourselves sealed until the day of redemption that nothing can ultimately destroy what God has done to purify the work of Christ on the inside. And he does that through the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Verse 13, in him you have been in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of, it to, possession of it to the praise of his glory. So I'm going to leave that there this morning and help us hopefully find a way today to be able to see scripturally what God has done in our lives that we can ultimately see in an illustration form today and hopefully we can find security and safety and the only person that security and safety will ever be found in, and that's in Christ. Let me mention, if I can, to you, back up to verse 13. Verse 13 sort of seems like the hinge verse of all of what we're talking about here. But the Scripture teaches us, and nine times in this one sentence, he uses this phrase, in Christ. So number, Roman numeral number one in your notes, we need to be reminded, he included me. He chose to include you. God the Father chose to include you. Knowing all the mess of your life, he chose you before the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ included you as he climbed upon Calvary's cross to be able to to pay for the sin debt that you and I both uh, needed to pay. And he paid it in our behalf. He redeemed us and offered to us forgiveness. And when Christ came to our life, he cleaned us up from the inside And ultimately, the Spirit of God now has included us in that he has brought us into a relationship with himself and ultimately sealed us into that relationship until the day of Jesus Christ. Nothing will ever be able to affect that which God has done in the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I was going to try to put this back in the bucket. I'm not sure I can. Let's see if I can this morning without bursting it. Well, 
That's good enough. I'll never get it out of there. I'll bur- I will burst it. Let me just say it this way. This shell, how many of you woke up this morning with a pain? This shell is your body. God did not, at the point of salvation, fix your body. It's going to be fixed one day. We're going to talk about that. But what God did was he took care of the inside. The Bible says to us that we're body, soul, and spirit. Ultimately, at the point of salvation, your spirit is made right with God. It is quickened. It's made alive. And ultimately, God washes our sin dead away so our spirit stands before God as perfect. And though the but the body, I could drop it and it would break. And I'm not going to do that today because somebody had to clean up the mess and it would be me. So I'm not going to do that today, but the reality is our body is going to break apart one day. It's going to fall apart, and ultimately it's going to give up. But the moment the Bible teaches us clearly that the moment that our body breathes its last breath, we breathe our first breath in glory, not because our body has been fixed, one day it will be, but because that which is on the inside has been sealed unto the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit of God, and we will ultimately stand with God because of what God has done on the inside of us. However... We still got this sin problem. And all through life, God is seeking to work in our lives to rectify, and and we use the word sanctification, to grow us up in our faith so that we might become more like him in our our actions, in in our deeds, in our our thoughts. Even though the inside of us are perfect, the outside of us, or the the will, the, 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 the will of man, your actions, your thoughts, is still in the sanctification process it's ultimately becoming transforming into his likeness because ultimately God included us that inclusion to three things I want to make quickly because I'm going to run out of time if I'm not careful three things that the scripture clearly says to if, if any man be in Christ he is a new creation the old is gone the new has come all things are becoming new So he teaches us clearly that when Christ comes into our life, there is, first of all, a radical transformation. Ultimately, he takes that which was impure and purifies it, which is called justification scripturally. He justifies us. He declares us as being perfect, even though we're not, all because of what Christ has done inside of us. John McKay said it this way, he becomes the soil in which we grow, the atmosphere in which we breathe, the source and goal of our entire existence is wrapped up in this relationship that begins at the point when we accept Christ into our life. We are in Christ, and at that point there's a beginning of a radical transformation that ultimately takes place in our spirit immediately and then grows out and develops in the rest of our life through sanctification. It ultimately, secondly, brings about a sense of dynamic unity. Dynamic unity is your next point. It brings us to the place of understanding that God has given us an opportunity as as believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are that. On On a real sense, we oftentimes call that brother or sister, but we are. We have a relationship with each other because we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. God has birthed this vertical relationship within us, through, through this point of salvation in order that the vertical relationship might be alive and well and would ultimately impact this horizontal relationship within us as well so that ultimately what God's doing in us vertically needs to transition out into the rest of our horizontal relationships. But that doesn't always happen, right? We know that, hap- that, we know that kind of thing happens in our world. And sometimes we don't, we're, not, we're not responding very godly. In Christ Jesus, we find ourselves sometimes sometimes rebelling against that, but the Scripture says to us the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love and joy and peace. All those things are relational aspects. God sometimes brings us in this place in our life, ultimately doing something on the inside to perfect us, but sometimes it takes a lot to perfect us on the outside, right? Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 says that there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. We're one in Christ because we've ultimately been made relationally right with him and ultimately we become brothers and sisters in Christ because of that. There's a third thing. 
that Scripture teach, teaches us regarding this, this response of what, when we come in Christ, it brings to us a sense of deep satisfaction. Of deep satisfaction. That's letter number C in your notes. John Stott was talking about commenting upon this passage and he said this. I love this. He used an old Chinese proverb and he, he says this. He said, if you want to be happy for one hour, get drunk. If you want to be happy for three days, get married. Or for 41 years in my case. If you want to be happy for eight days, kill a pig and eat it. If you want to be happy forever, the Chinese proverb says, become a gardener. The reality is, what we look for and long for in life, we never attain. We cannot on this side of eternity with uh, with, the, with all the efforts of humanity attain that which we're longing for and that satisfaction. And yet Jesus said it this way, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. The only way we'll ever find real satisfaction is in this relationship we have with Christ. So this relationship affects us tra transform transformationally radically changes our lives because he washes our sins away. It brings us into a relationship vertically and horizontally where we find ourselves in this position of life where there's an opportunity for dynamic unity and ultimately he develops within us an opportunity that we can now find satisfaction in this relationship with Christ that otherwise we could never have known. But God's not only relationally dealing with us in Christ, he's also at work within me. Aren't you glad God's not finished yet? He's still working on me, the little children's song, and I'm so grateful that he's not finished yet. And his work is identified particularly for us in this passage, and I want to go back, if we can, to the text, and let, let us, if we can, deal with this, and that's point number two in your notes, his work in me. His work in me. As God is seeking to work in my life, ultimately he chose us before the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world determined that he would be the ransom for humanity. And at one point in time in your life, we came to faith in Christ if you know him as your personal savior. And the spirit of God at that moment also sealed us. But there's a whole process that God is seeking to do in your life before then and ultimately after then. So if I can this morning, take an opportunity and let's just identify that verse 13 gives to us a, a, a real keen sense of understanding of how this work does. Verse 13 says this, in him, you also, when you, here's your word, heard, you need to first understand that letter A in your notes, he has called you. You heard the call. I remember vividly at my experience, and I've shared it many times in the kitchen of my home with a little yellow chair. I, I, I didn't physically hear God call my name, but I sensed his work in my life. And if you know Christ is your Savior, you've got to remember some of that. You've got to remember how God was at work. And I, I wasn't, I, I never murdered anybody, never even thought about it at seven years of age, but I was still a sinner. I still needed a Savior. And I, and I remember coming home from Sunday night and doing all the things that a seven-year-old boy might do to try to fix the unsettledness in his heart with Walt Disney, or the television show, or with ice cream. But the reality, the only, only thing that would ever satisfy the heart, the longing of the heart, was to answer the call. That the Holy Spirit was working in my life. He called me. The word call there is interesting that he uses there. He uses the word akao that actually means to this. To hear with understanding. How many times have we tried to share something with somebody and it seems like we're beating our head up against a brick wall? I mean, you've been there, haven't you? You talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. The reality is that's, what's, that's the problem is we're trying to convince people on a human level of something they need to do on a spiritual level and until the Spirit of God begins to work in their life to draw them to himself, we might as well be beating our head up against a brick wall, right? But when we've heard with understanding... We sense God's call, and then here's your next point. When God, through the Spirit of God, has now provided faith, 
that you would believe. You've heard his call. You've also believed. When those two things mesh together, they come together, there's a supernatural event that takes place in your life and my life. At that moment, we come to faith in Jesus Christ and God washes our sin away. What a day that will be. Yes, what a day that will be one day, but what a day that was when your eternity and my eternity was settled. Not because you're good enough or I'm good enough. We're not. But because he is and he chose us, he provided for us and the Holy Spirit has now sealed us and, and we're his because of what God has done through the Trinity to bring us into relationship with himself. He has provided, he called us, he has provided faith having believed. Verse 13 goes on to say, we were then sealed, sealed. He has marked us, point number three, or letter C in your notes. He has marked us with a seal. He has placed us in a lot better situation than inside of this Ziploc baggie because a, a, a sharp object would take care of this, right? Maybe somebody getting a little rough with it might take care of it, right? But in, Christ, in, the, in, in the sealing of the Holy Spirit, nothing... Listen to this, nothing can separate us from him. Romans 8 ends that way that nothing, death and life and all, there's a whole list of things could ever separate us from the love of God in Christ. And so what God does in our life is he seals us into the day of redemption. That, purpose, that, that sealing has at least three purposes. If I can, real quickly, I want to identify those three purposes for us. It brings, first of all, it confirms something is genuine. It confirms something is genuine. When I was growing up and, you know, I had, we had school and that kind of stuff, and I don't know whether they still do that in school or not, you know, when the kids go in, do, they, do you have to wear... Uh, name brand clothing in school these days is that required still in, the, in my day that's what it was you know and if you if you walked in I remember back in the day that that was there was two brands of blue jeans that a, that a boy could wear he was either Wranglers or Levi's anything else was just and sometimes my mother would find a bargain somewhere and she would buy one of those pair of breeches that uh that wasn't Levi's or Wrangler's and somehow or another they never got worn quite as much as the rest because we wanted the genuine article on if we were going to wear clothes, right? I want you to understand today that when the Holy Spirit of God came into your life, he validated your life. He validated the seal and guaranteed it to be genuine and it was the genuine article. I remember a few uh, it's probably been a year or so ago. I mentioned in service somewhere along the way that I've, all, I've, all, I've been to Nassau many, many times. And after the fire in Nassau, they, they, they took away a lot of the things. And the old straw market was put back together with a really ni much nicer place. But one of the things they lost was the little vendors that stood outside selling Breitling and, and, and Rolex watches for less than $100. I mean, I, I just loved it. Well, I, I mentioned that in service, and my, my good friend George Hoverkamp, while he was over in the Middle East somewhere, I guess found one of those little places and went in and actually bought a Rolex watch for less than $100, of course, and he brought it and gave it to me. What a neat gift it was, right? As a reminder of, uh, of that. But the, while that watch has the name on it as Rolex, it is not the genuine article. When the Holy Spirit of God sealed you with a seal, he put the stamp of Almighty God upon your life to remind us that we are genuine. We're part of the genu genuine article. It secondly not only uh, determines something as genuine, it also identifies the item with its owner. It identifies the item with its owner. When I, was, when I played t-ball back in the day, I loved, I loved t-ball. I loved coaching t-ball. You know, it was great when those little, little kids out there, you, you had those kids that some of them paid attention and some of them you didn't. The ones that didn't pay attention, we typically put in the outfield. And I remember looking out in the outfield and see those little kids, you know, they watching the planes and swatting at a bee and the ball comes rolling by them. They're still swatting at a bee or whatever it is, you know. <laughs> I remember t-ball back in the day when I was 
when I was, I, the first team I was a part of, it was a neat team. It was a little, little town in South Winston, Salem, North Carolina. And, and it was, here it is, you catch this one. We were the Nats. <laughs> Why would anybody call a team the Nats? <laughs> but that's what we were. We put our shirts on and we were proud to be the Nats. <laughs> we were part of the team, right? It's the same kind of way we put our shirts on possibly to, to be a, you know, a, a Gator or that other team up in North Florida somewhere or whatever it is. <laughs> it brings about a sense of identity with a college, with a school, or with the Savior. When you and I were sealed, it not only provided a sense of genuineness, a promise of guarantee of genuineness, it also identifies us with our Heavenly Father. The third thing it does, it ensures that something is indeed secure. You know, we talked about in the beginning, the, the days preceding Pearl Harbor, and the guaranteed security that those men and women would be found safe on the island. History tells us a different story. Because history reminds us that security can only be bound up in the value or the person that's promising security. When you and I have been secured in Christ, we have been secured in the creator of the universe. There is no force, no identity, there is no person greater than he is, and we find ourselves secure, not in our best efforts, or in our family, or whatever it may be, we find ourselves secure only and, and, and especially in Christ and in our relationship with God. There's a second, or a, a second thing that we find regarding, or letter D in your notes, I should say, a fourth thing that this ceiling does for us. It also provides a sense of deposit. I, I know that most of us probably along the journey have maybe bought a house or maybe we've chosen to rent a piece of property somewhere along the way and and as a security deposit we actually we actually put down a few dollars uh, as as a promise to say that I'll come back and finish paying that which I started the scripture says to us clearly in this passage listen to what he says verse 13 in him when you heard the truth that's the that's this calling and when you, the gospel, and believed in him, that's this, this concept of, of belief or faith, and we're sealed, that's the sealing of the Holy Spirit. He becomes the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. He becomes the, here's the word, Arabon in the original language. He becomes the down payment, as it were. Uh, that the, the more of the same is going to be coming. And I remember back, we all can look back at our life and sort of look and recognize that what God has been doing in our life to this point, and we can celebrate the fact that God's done some amazing things in our life to this point. But I just want to encourage you today that whatever God has done to this point in your life, it's nothing compared to what he's going to do. That's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1, 9 and 10. I had not seen, nor ear has heard, nor, my, nor is even your mind conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by a spirit. He's promised it to us as if we've already received it. But the reality is no, no, no matter how good life has been to this point, the best is still yet to come. That all we've been able to, to, to experience is the deposit. And one of these days, we're going to get to experience the, the full price that was paid. Everything as, God is, as we are God's possession and God's promise to us. God has given us so many wonderful things. And we have an opportunity through Jesus Christ to be sealed into the day. And one of these days, we have an opportunity to stand before him as perfect individuals. Not because we were but because of what Christ did in us and what the Spirit has done to preserve that which Christ did in us. How should it affect our life? Well, it should affect every facet of our life. Our relationships, our concerns, our anxiety. When we look at an st impending storm like Milton, 
Uh, it should affect that. We should know that we're secure in Christ. We, we should understand that. And if God uses a, a, an event like this, I mean, we look back at a, my home state in Asheville, and I, I don't know how many hundreds of people now have, they've discovered it's died through the, the storm Hel Helene. And, uh, and others across the coast of Florida and up into Georgia and South Carolina. You know, the neat thing about it is that no matter what, how God may allow our lives to be taken, and one day they will be taken from us. No matter how God allows our life to be taken, we're secure in Him because of what the Holy Spirit has done in salvation. Just know this, point number two, or last point in your notes, and then we're going to come back together for just a second. Just be sure of this. God has chosen you. And I know that I know that I know in the world in which we're facing today, and, I, and I'm seeing it all around our church family. I'm seeing it all around our families back up north. There's a sense of brokenness unlike anything I've ever seen in my time in the past. It's a tough spot. And I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that because God chose us, God didn't choose junk. He chose you because you were precious in his sight. And don't lose sight of that, would you? I'm going to ask you if you would to stand back to your feet just now. And I'm going to ask you to do, go back to that person that you saw that you spoke with earlier. You know, I asked you before when you came in, Speak to somebody. How can I pray for you? I want you to go back to that individual, and I want you to pray for them today. Can you do that? I'm, for the next few moments, I'm just going to give you freedom to go back and pray for those people that you actually spoke to earlier. So this is your time to go do that, would you? You can move around. It's okay. Say something. That's fine. Well, I, I'll say that whenever I give a presentation. Just tell me. give you just a couple more moments if I can to pray and then I'm going to close this in prayer Father I just want to say thank you today for the privilege that we have as your children to pray for one another as I've thought about this week and I've thought about what you're doing in our world and it's to be honest with you Lord sometimes it seems as if God is absent in our world 
and we know you're not. But I just felt this week that we needed to be practice what you, Jesus, said that the house of the Lord should, would, should be called a house of prayer. And so God, today, thank you for the privilege we have to be able to not only shake a hand, to hug a neck, to demonstrate some love for each other, but we can come alongside of each other and pray for each other. And I pray that what's been shared today and both our prayer time is, and, and as well in our sharing time, might carry with us all week long and that those individuals that we have prayed for might be a part of our praying process throughout the week. That God may be glorified and honored and that lives might be transformed and changed because we have not only walked with you, but we've carried people before the throne of grace that we have met today. So God, continue your work of transformation in us. I'm grateful that our spirit's been perfect, been made, made perfect by one moment of time. But the rest of us is a mess. And uh, I just pray that you'll continue your work of sanctifying us and growing us into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ that we might represent to a lost and dying world an image of your son that would be an attraction to them and would ultimately draw them to faith in Jesus Christ. Bless us, Father, as we worship, as we wrap up our time together, I pray that you would manifest yourself in our presence, that ultimately, Father, we might be able to see you at work and that we might celebrate what you've already been doing. And we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.